Most media stories on quantum computing um, leave a lot to be desired. That's what gives quantum computers their power. They compute on not just one universe, but an infinite number of parallel universes. <laughs> okay, on the one hand, that was legit funny. On the other hand, it's a symptomatic picture of the many wrong and half-baked ideas about quantum computing. And that is because, one, quantum computing is a subtle and complicated topic. And two, because we as humans always fall for the most sensationalistic and overhyped stories. So that is what the media delivers. I have written my thesis on quantum computation, so um, this topic is very close to my heart. And I'm trying to provide better information. In this vein, you might want to check out my introduction video about the limits and promises of quantum computation. I specifically did not want to go the way of just minimal details and wishy-washy analogies because that's what really upsets me the most about all those popular science descriptions of quantum mechanics. They almost always skip the details and models and only give you some conclusions some statements which are impossible to understand on their own. Instead, I decided to challenge the viewers a bit, but this would also allow me to go to a much deeper explanation. That way, we can talk in a much more meaningful way about questions like Is it true that qubits can be 0 and 1 at the same time? Are they always random? And if so, how can we build a useful computer around that? What even is a qubit? I will explain quantum bits by using a simple but not trivial model. And if you understand that, you understand more about quantum bits and uh, quantum systems in general than 90% of people. Ready? Let's go. Let's start with the obvious first question. What is a qubit? A qubit is a quantum mechanical system that has two different states it can be in. For example, two different energy levels in an atom or ion, or two different spin states of a photon or electron. Anyway, the beauty of quantum computing is that we do not even have to understand all the details of the underlying physical system. Just like with normal digital computing, you do not need to understand all the details of voltage and current and all the electrical signaling. All you need to know is there's zeros and there's ones. For quantum computing, all we need to understand is there is a system that is small and isolated enough to be quantum in nature, and it has two states, zero and one. In other words, qubits are inherently two-dimensional and to model this correctly, we need to take some ideas of a field called linear algebra. Well, that's right. Vectors. 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 Okay, okay, okay. Stay with me. This will make much more sense in a minute. In the most basic sense, a vector simply denotes a direction. Of course, um, the concepts of vectors and vector spaces are far more abstract and comprehensive than that. But we simply do not need this here. Right, so as I said, uh, directions. Um, to define a geometrical vector, we simply say it goes from here to here, and then we draw it as an arrow. For example, in 2D space, we can have a vector in the x direction or the y direction. We usually signify vectors by a little vector arrow, so we can write this arrow is just a symbol that tells us that something is a vector. We can also have a vector in an intermediate direction, meaning it has a component in the x direction and another component in the y direction. Another important thing is that we do not have to use x and y to describe vectors. We can use a different basis, for example, two different vectors u and w. We can describe any vector in either the x and y basis or the u and w basis, or any other basis that we choose. Okay, that's all we need. Let's go back to bits and qubits.
the connection between vectors and uh, bits and qubits is this. Classical bits are much like two separate directions, for example the x and y vectors. But this is such a simple system that we usually do not even bother with the vector description, because we would gain very little from it. Qubits, though, can be in any mixture of states, so the vector description is both useful and meaningful. You may have seen this before. In quantum physics, we use a slightly different notation for vectors, called the Dirac notation. We write a state vector like this and call it a cat for, quote, silly reasons. Note that this is not a geometrical vector, which gives a, a, a real direction in real space. It's a vector of an abstract state space, where the directions are equal to the states the system can be in. So the direction of the state vector indicates which mixture of states the qubit is in. According to the rules of quantum mechanics, a general state of a two-level system, like a qubit, can be written like this. More precisely, we say that the qubit is in a superposition of the states 0 and 1, and alpha and beta are the respective amplitudes. In the case of qubits, we have the standard basis of 0 and 1, but we can also use the plus and minus basis. These two bases are related and can be freely transformed from one to the other. For historical reasons, we call these the C basis and the X basis. One other important consequence we can immediately see here is that if you describe a state in a different basis, the superposition may vanish. So whether a state is in a superposition or not is entirely dependent on the basis used. Uh, we can go a step further and uh, define a third dimension for the qubit called the plus i and minus i states. And if we adjust the angles in this diagram a bit, this gives us the so-called Bloch sphere. A common and useful depiction of single qubits. Either way, a uh, state description is only one half of the quantum weirdness. The second half is measurement. Everything I've said about quantum states so far only applies to isolated systems, so systems that do not interact with their environment. However, the entire point of computation is to generate some output, so sooner or later you will have to make a measurement and an interaction with the system. And these are the rules for measurements. Whenever you perform a measurement, the qubit is forced into one of the possible basis states. So you can only ever measure 0 or 1, never both. So even if you can potentially encode more information in qubits, you can only ever get one bit of information out. This projection onto a basis state, triggered by measurement, is called state reduction or the collapse of the wave function. And as far as we can tell, it is random, irreversible, and almost instantaneous. While the measurement result is random, the meaning of a superposition is that the amplitudes give the probabilities for the different results. The state with the larger amplitude is more likely to be the outcome. In terms of our vector language, if the state vector points more into the direction of one basis state, then this state is more likely to be measured. This also means that if a state already is in a basis state, you will get that result with 100% probability. So if you have many identical copies of a quantum state, you can predict the, the distribution of the measurement outcomes, but each individual measurement will be random and you can only give the probability for each outcome. Also, any measurement can only be performed in a specific basis. If you measure a qubit in a C basis, you only get the 0 or 1 state as outcome. Well, when you measure it in the X basis, you can only get the plus or minus states, etc. 
Let's look at an example. The state 1 over square root of 2 uh, times 0 plus 1. If we measure it in the C basis, we would get either 0 or 1, each with a 50% probability. However, if we measure that in the X basis, we will get plus, with a 100% probability. After a measurement, the state of the qubit will be equal to the measured basis state and the previous state will be irretrievably lost. These are the rules for measurement and uh, they are a large part of what makes quantum mechanics so strange. And to be fair, while we can uh, reasonably well describe the effects of a measurement, there are still many open questions around it. For example, what exactly qualifies as a measurement? What are the details of it? What are the mechanics of it? There are so many open questions, in fact, that uh, we talk about the measurement problem of quantum mechanics. But now, let's use everything we've learned so far and tackle the questions raised in the beginning. Can qubits really be 0 and 1 at the same time? Uh, the main problem I have with this statement is that it's so vague. In a way it is true, because an isolated qubit can be in a superposition of both uh, 0 and 1, but whenever it is measured, it is either 0 or 1, never both at the same time. So I consider this statement to be incomplete and misleading and all in all just not very useful. Are qubits always random? Does that mean we simply don't know what we're doing? Let's return quickly to the example from earlier. If we measure the state plus in the C basis, we get 0 or 1 with a 50% probability each. If we measure it in the X basis, we get plus with 100%. This shows us that quantum mechanics doesn't mean that we can't know measurement outcomes. Because there are bases where we do. Quantum mechanics doesn't just simply mean everything is probabilistic all the time. There is a clear mathematical model behind it. If measurement outcomes are always random, how can we ever build a useful computer with that? That is an excellent question and it will be treated in my next video on quantum computation, which will be about quantum algorithms.